This show is part of the Head Stuff Podcast Network. Kate. Kate. Can you still hear us? Shh. I need to concentrate. Just. just let it happen. Francois, we can't rush this. It's not like the last one. Time. I know. I know. Can you feel it? It's happening. There is a tumor in life that is not as the common direction. Albert, you're sure about this? Yes, it will be fine. Just make sure the door is firmly locked. Yes, it's locked. I, I checked it. Oh my god. He's so much larger than I would have thought. I Fascinating. Look at the cranial structure. Surely this is Haeckel's Pithecanthropus. Is this what we... Uh, who is he? No, let's all stay nice and calm. Albert! He's a lot more alert than the orangutan. Look, he's trying to establish where he is. Who we are. Yes, I would expect so. He's far higher up the evolutionary chain, remember? Let's just see what he does. Look, Kate is out of the trance. She's back with us. He doesn't seem to be registering that she is there, though. Look, he's totally fixated on us. Yes. Let's try to stay still. Don't approach him. Let him take everything in, and then we can... Jesus! Stop! Francois, he's headed for Emma! Hey, stop! Ah! Ah! The door! Albert, he's escaping! I can't... Oh, God. Francois... Are you all right? Oh my God, you're bleeding. Yes, I'm... Uh, he, he really took a swipe at me. I'm, I'm not hurt badly. Are you sure? Oh, thank God. Albert, did he get out? Where's the... Whatever he was. I'm afraid he went straight out of the front door. He's... He's gone. Gone? He'll dematerialize, though. He has to. Doesn't he? This is too much, Albert. Kate, uh, are you still connected to him? What's going on? No, I don't think. I don't know. What have I done? What have we done, Kate? This is on all of us. Greatest Matter by Connor Reed. Episode 1 A Criminologist in Dublin. Is that everything, Sean? Yeah. That's it. All closed up now. God, it's a cold one. And you did the padlock and the bolt on the gate there, like Mr. Stevens asked? Yeah, sure, I just. And the cash box from the office, because didn't Mr. Stevens. Anya, it's done. Mr. Stevens trusted me to do the job. That's why he gave me the promotion. That's it. Locked up. No elephants strolling round Phoenix Park tonight. All right, all right. I'm only asking because I know the new job's important to you. No, I know. Sorry, I, I know you mean well. Now, it's getting dark. Let me walk you to the omnibus. Oh, thanks, Sean. You're very good. Oh, it's lovely in the park with the snow, isn't it? So quiet. That was some snowfall yesterday, wasn't it? And out of nowhere. I'd say it'll be a bit warmer tomorrow, though. Ah, the zoo is miserable in that sort of cold. <laughs> I'm sure the penguins love it. Well, that's true. <laughs> so, any plans for tomorrow? You're always one for filling up your Sundays with all sorts of activities. I don't know where you get the energy. Did I not tell you? Simon's bringing me to see the cinematograph over in the Star. Have you ever been? 
Ah, no, that wouldn't really be my thing now. Prefer a pint in the pub than looking at move and pictures. Ah, Sean, you're useless. Simon went before and he said it's like you're really there. It's similar to the kinetoscope, but everyone can watch together. Simon saw a train pulling into a station and it wasn't just the people moving. It was everything. The smoke and the steam from the train, the wind blowing. It sounds wonderful. Sure I can see a train down at the Kingsbridge station and not pay a shilling for the pleasure. (laughs) Ah, Sean. Anyway, I'm excited. We've got great seats and we're going to... Going to... Going to... Sorry, I'm I'm just... Do you see that? What? There. In the bushes up ahead. There? Oh, is it a boot or... No, but it's... No, it... Look, it's a leg. Someone's passed out in the bushes there. Come on. Oh, 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 wait now on you. Let me have a look. Could be anyone in there. But they might need our help. Come on. It's all right. Wait. Sir? Excuse me. Sir? Are you all right? Can you hear me? Hang on, Anya. Let me... Just... Oh, Jesus. Oh, mother of God. What the hell happened? There's blood everywhere. Ah, no, Anya, look away. This isn't something for a woman no. to see. Is he... Is he dead, Sean? Yes, he's dead. It looks like he's been, I don't know, stabbed or attacked or... uh, Look, I don't know. We need to call the police. Look at these clothes. Or what's left of them. He's he's some gentleman or something. Let's get Mr. Stevens. What? Mr. Stevens. There's a dead man a hundred yards from the entrance to his zoo. Tomorrow, Sunday, the place will be packed. Mr. Stevens would want to know first. Yes, I suppose you're right. God... And there's all those society fellas visiting tomorrow too. All right, you run to the lodge and get him. I'll stay here with this poor soul. God have mercy on him. And be careful. The renowned Professor Cesare Lombroso, what an absolute pleasure to meet you at last. You are too kind, Dr. Ryan. The pleasure is all mine. Thank you for the invitation. It's my first time in this beautiful city. Well, I don't know if Dublin can quite compete with the wonders of Italy, but I've called it my home for many years now, and it's a fine place to live. I do hope you'll enjoy your stay. This is a lovely hotel. Waiter, a glass of red wine for the professor? You had a pleasant trip from Turin? I hope the snow didn't affect your travels. No, it was fine in the end. And very atmospheric arriving in the city covered in snow. I believe it's not too common here. No, not at all. And you're right, it does give the city a certain atmosphere, all right. Did you come via Paris? Yes, Paris and then London. I met several of our esteemed colleagues at the Sorbonne. Professeur Dupont sends his warmest regards. Ah, he's a fine researcher. I was fascinated by his article on degeneracy in The Lancet recently. And of course, I've been following your extensive work on criminal man, Luomo Delinquente. (laughs) Apologies for the pronunciation. I'm afraid my Italian is not up to much. We must talk more about translations. I've got contacts in New York who I'm sure would be interested. Well, I would be much obliged. Thank you. It's wonderful to see so many doctors and scientists taking such an interest in the wider field of criminology. And why wouldn't we? We're all on the front lines of treating the insane, the weak-minded, the criminal... Your work is pioneering. Now, let me introduce you to a few of my colleagues over here. We have a little time before we need to get you over to the Rotunda for your speech. A wonderful venue. Do you know it? I'll confess I don't. But Dr. Purefoy mentioned in his letter that he'd seen Charles Dickens's farewell readings there as a young boy. And it had left quite the impression. Oh, yes, of course. That would have been 68, 69, maybe? One of many great speakers at the Rotunda over the decades. Oh, and there is Dr. Purfoy there. You'll have to meet him in person. Excellent. I would be delighted to. We've been in correspondence regarding anthropometric measurements, and he was most generous with his time. Of course. After you. Come on, Margaret. We're going to be late. Oh, we're fine. The talk doesn't start for another half an hour. But at your pace, it'll take that long. Here, I'm not the one who chose to stop to buy roasted nuts from Jim at his stall. I was hungry. 
And besides, you know I can't resist Jim's nuts. <laughs> oh, don't. <laughs> Everything at his stall is so delicious. And why have you stopped walking? Come on. I'm coming. I'm coming. I'm trying not to kill myself slipping on all this ice. Anyway, at worst we'll miss some long, rambling introduction to this Lombroso fellow. This Lombroso fellow is a famous psychiatrist and professor of the criminal mind. I told you this was important to me. The talk sounds fascinating, and it's great research for my novel. Yes, but from what you've told me about it, you don't even agree with the man. Well, no, well, not everything, but I've only read a small bit of his work. The man is a renowned thinker across Europe. He must be doing something right. And besides, just because I don't agree with him, it doesn't mean I won't get some good ideas for my novel, or he won't be a good speaker. Fine. Eels, Fine. Jelly deals, oh, oh, look, Francis, jelly they're deals. selling jellied eels over there. Maybe I'll just... Are you serious? Margaret, we don't have time. Come on. Oh, Fran. <laughs> Let go. I'm joking. Over here. On you. He's just over here, Mr. Stevens. What's going on, Sean? I don't know, sir. We just found him here. We need to call the authorities. Get this sorted. We don't need a dead man, whoever he is, at the entrance to Dublin Zoo. Not this weekend of all times. I can send a telegraph from the office, sir. Yes. And I can get the... Wait, sir. I've been looking at the body here and... Well, I don't know. It's, it's just... Just what? Well, it's just... I'm no doctor, but I've been looking at all these scratches. The cuts... The torn clothes. It kind of looks like he's been attacked. What are you getting at, John? He's torn to pieces, sir. Look, it looks like he's been attacked by an animal. Maybe a a tiger or something. Poor man. Oh, Jesus, no. He could be right. But we're outside the zoo gates. You, You locked up, Sean. You checked with the other zookeepers. You did the final rounds. You did do the... Yes, sir, I checked everything. The tigers are all in their cages. I'm positive. Are you? Jesus Christ, Sean. If we have a man mauled by a tiger, a tiger whose whereabouts we have no idea. But, sir, you know our tigers as well as I do. They wouldn't do this. Check. What? Check the cages. Make sure all the tigers are there. And any of the other dangerous animals. Anya, go with them. I'll go around from this side. Now. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Oh, oh, no, no. This can't be happening. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening, and welcome to the Rotunda. My name is Dr. Douglas Ryan, and it is with the utmost pleasure that I introduce our esteemed speaker, Professor Cesare Lombroso, doctor, linguist, man of letters, professor of forensic medicine, and most recently, professor of psychiatry at the University of Torino in Italy. A pioneer in the field of criminology and the author of a hugely important study of criminal man. Now, as some of you may be aware, Professor Lombroso will address the Royal Zoological Society tomorrow at a gathering in Dublin Zoo. This evening, however, it is his wish to speak to a more general public about his vital work on the criminal man. How do we recognize the born criminal? How do we check his pervasiveness in our society? What can we do to reduce crime in a city like Dublin? A problem I am confident you will agree in desperate need of a solution. Professor Lombroso. This is quite the turn at market, isn't it? I know. It's so hot in here. I'm passing out in this outfit. Dr. Ryan, ladies and gentlemen, thank you. <clears throat> ladies and gentlemen, everyone in this room has first-hand experience of crime in its many guises. You've had something stolen, perhaps, or been a victim of fraud or blackmail, assault or abuse. Perhaps someone you know is a lawyer or a police officer, works in a prison, or indeed has been to prison themselves. 
Crime is, alas, part of our lives. And we all have strong opinions on the matter. On how to reduce it, how to police it, and how to deal with criminals. And yet, amongst all these opinions is shockingly little science. Crime is all around us, and yet it is so rarely studied in any systematic fashion. Where are the statistics, the facts, the experimental data? And where, above all, is the focus on the criminal himself? Judges are wont to completely ignore the criminal and focus on the crime. And yet, we know that personal and social circumstances dictate crime. Not only this, but we know there are traits and anomalies that mark out the criminal. Criminals, not just crimes, must be closely studied. My work in recent years has carefully categorized the cultural, physical, and psychological traits of the criminal in order to bring a much clearer picture to this area, to the field of what I believe is best termed criminology. This is what I wish to address in my talk here today, ladies and gentlemen. Who is the criminal man? and, to a lesser degree, the criminal woman. What does he look like? How does he act? And how should he be treated? Not just in terms of incarceration, oh, but also... He's not a bad speaker, see? I told you it would be an interesting talk. How much of his work have you read, anyway? There's not much in English yet, but I read a French translation of some of it and... Ladies, do you mind? Oh, Sorry, I'm terribly sorry. We'll discuss some of the advantages of your own Irish system of incarceration. The system commendably draws on criminal psychology to allow prisoners move through a series of stages and rewards, starting from a period of isolation with nothing but ragged clothes, a meagre vegetarian diet, and mundane tasks well, to complete. Well, don't here. even start. Well, this is science, Francis. Vegetarianism is a criminal punishment. I told you. I knew you'd pick up on that. It's not me saying this. This is the renowned professor of criminology. Yeah, yes, well, as I've said before, vegetarianism is a bold Ladies, statement. Ladies, please, I am trying to listen to the professor. Oh, yeah, yeah, sorry, John sorry. Mark of course, pardon me. In a number of me. ways, as we'll see, criminals, especially forgers, have larger volume heads than the insane but never, on average, as large as the healthy man. They will more frequently have dark eyes and thick black hair. Thieves, in particular, are notable for their misshapen noses and bushy eyebrows. And in nearly all criminals, uh, one oh, will make large what? ears and... Misshapen nose? Bushy eyebrows? Large ears? I think he's describing your Uncle Ever. <laughs> Hey, what does that make him? A forger, was it? <laughs> Margaret! Ladies, this is outrageous. I am trying to listen. Who are you here with? Who is accompanying you? Sir, I'm trying to listen. Will you kindly talk to your companions after the speech? What? These are not my companions. I'm asking them to... It's not Please me. Please, just keep quiet while the professor is talking. Yes, sir, it's quite distracting. Yes, if you can please be quiet. What? But a How? huge over-reliance on incarceration. Where is the evidence that simply locking up all types of criminals is any sort of solution? So many minor crimes are driven by poverty. These are not criminals by nature. Simply desperate men driven to desperate acts. Imprisonment is not the answer. And it's not just social factors leading to incarceration, but psychological ones too. The insane should be treated in hospitals and asylums, not prisons. And I would like to draw on my own pioneering work in several asylums in Italy to illustrate this. First, however, let me begin by taking stock of the state of crime here in Ireland and how it relates. So? So what? So what did you think of the talk? Fine. You were right. He's quite compelling. I'm not so sure about this born criminal business, but he does talk a lot of sense about how all those criminals were basically locked up for being poor. Yes. 
I liked what he said about poverty and social issues. He's not one of those conservative, lock them all up and throw away the key types. And he's persuasive, isn't he? All that experience in the asylums in Italy, all those case studies. He's a great speaker, all right. Do you think there might be anything in it for one of your weeklies? I don't know. It's far too academic for the Dublin Weekly. And I've got that other piece still to write for the Irish cyclist anyway. Unless I can convince Cesare Lombroso to go on a little cycling jaunt around Dublin. What do you think? <laughs> yes. Uh, speaking of cycling, my safety's just here. Where's yours? I'm just over there. Oh, I don't know what I was thinking wearing this outfit. You're far more sensible than yours. Come on, let's go. It's getting late. At least the roads aren't so slippery now. Ah, look at them and their safety bicycles. You right, ladies? Don't get your petticoats all caught up now. We wouldn't want two beautiful ladies such as ourselves getting upset on a nice evening like this, would we? We'll be fine, gentlemen. Women and bicycles everywhere these days. It's ridiculous. You know, husbands, to talk some sense into you. Come on, Francis. Let's go. Ah, sure, they're all at it now. It's all for show. They probably can't even ride them properly. Sir, I can confidently say we can ride these bicycles considerably better than you've ridden anything or anyone in your lifetime. <laughs> Francis, <laughs> come on. Uh, what's that supposed to mean? Hey, how dare you say that? Hey, come back here. <laughs> come on, <laughs> down this way. <laughs> that was very unlike you. I can't believe you said that. That's that's the second time this week I've had to put up with that nonsense. Can't ride a bicycle. I cycled to Wicklow and back last weekend, Margaret. 50 miles. And I still think you're both crazy and incredibly impressive. Oh, I meant to say, I'm looking after Elizabeth tomorrow. I said I'd bring her to the zoo. Would you like to come along? It's Sunday. Only a penny in. We could meet you at noon at the entrance. I know how you feel about the zoo. No, but... it's fine. A zoo is not a place for wild animals, but I know how much Elizabeth adores it. And I really would love to see her. She's getting so big. Ah, Elizabeth will be delighted. You know how much she looks up to you. All right, then. We can meet at noon at the entrance. I won't be able to stay all day, though. I've got that meeting with my publisher, and I need to do some preparation. Well, on you. Anything? All the animals, all there, sir. Uh, tigers are fine, nothing suspicious. And we checked in on the wolves, orangutans, lions, nothing. Uh, Sean's doing a final loop round by the monkeys. He should be back in a minute. Right. Well, that's the start. Thank God this looks like it's nothing to do with us. Oh, here's Sean coming now. He can give us the final word and... Wait. What's he doing? Look. He's seen something. Look. Over there. Oh, yes, look. There's someone running from the bushes over there. Do you see him? Sir, we can cut him off this way. No, wait, here. stop. Anya, it's too dangerous. He's heading the other way now. Sean's far closer and he's never going to catch him. Damn it. He's fast. He's over the fence already. Sean. Sean, come back. He's gone. Do you think he was the murderer? Well, what in God's name was he doing if he wasn't? Look, we've done all we could. Will you go to the office and telegram the police to come at once? Yes, sir. That lad could run. I saw. Straight up and over the fence. Like one of the bloody orangutans. I know. Could you see from where you were? Was there a strange light or something? I don't know if he was carrying a small lamp or... Oh, I don't know. Nothing I could see from where I was. Listen, Sean. You've gone above and beyond. Yourself and Anya. Nothing else you could have done. Anya's contacting the police now. If you'll wait until we talk to them... We can get this all sorted and get home to our beds. So much for a Saturday night by the fire. Thanks for all your help. Not at all, sir. I don't think I'll be sleeping much tonight. That poor man. What a way to die. Who do you think he is or was? I've no idea. All we know now is that it wasn't a zoo animal that killed him, but... My God. By the looks of that body, it may as well have been. A toast, Professor, to a wonderful talk this evening. Thank you, Dr. Ryan. I thought it went very well indeed. It has been wonderful to meet so many of your colleagues. 
I have to find some time later for a discussion with Dr. Dixon. We have a mutual friend in Paris, and I've been following his recent zoological work with great interest. The craniological measurements of criminals and apes have fascinating parallels. Indeed, but we'll have plenty of time to discuss all of this tomorrow after you're addressed to the Zoological Society. For now, let's have a drink. Another glass of wine? No, thank you. I'm... Uh... After such a fine talk, a celebratory light like this... Surely you'll have a glass of wine. No, it's... Dr. Ryan, I'm afraid it's... Well, not the drinking so much as the drink. The wine is... If I'm honest, it's undrinkable. Oh, I... Now, I have a very fine 1886 Chianti Classico in my suitcase in the lobby. I never travel without a few bottles of excellent wine. One can't be too careful. Perhaps I'll fetch it and you might join me. (laughs) Absolutely. Ottimo. I think my suitcase is still in the lobby. Give me just a moment. Excuse me, is my luggage still here or has it been brought up to my room? I need to... Professor Lombroso. Excuse me one moment. Madam, do I know you? I'm Miss Scott. Beatrice Scott? We corresponded about your visit tonight to the... Maggie Cos, what are you doing here? And in person, I was very clear that I would make my own way to the house. Well, it can be difficult to get a cab around here at this time of night, Professor. I thought I'd collect you myself. My brother-in-law is a cab driver. He's just outside. Yes, but I can't be seen with you right now. There are distinguished men of science. They won't understand what we're doing. Well, as men of science, they should be exactly the sort of people. Yes, yes, of course. I know that. But it's about appearances, Miss Scott, and my capacity here as a professor of criminology. Also, I really don't understand why this all has to be quite so late at night. I know, but as I explained, Professor, in my particular case, it seems to work best in the very early hours of the morning. And who am I to... Yes, yes. Can you wait outside with your brother? Or whoever it is. I'll be out as soon as I can. There are people here who would like to speak to me. I can't just... Leave. All right. I was trying to do you a favour, but I can see when I'm not wanted. Miss Scott, please. I do appreciate the transport. And I have the utmost respect for your abilities. It's just... How this looks? Precisely. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'll be out as soon as I can. Now, Dr. Ryan... Where were we? Oh, you couldn't find the wine. Excuse me? The vino, this famous bottle of Chianti that you were getting. Oh, of course, the wine. I, uh, I had to... Yes, excuse me again, and let me get that bottle after all. Oh, Mr. Stevens, I just, I cannot believe. I, I'm just, I'm in shock. You must have gotten an awful fright, oh, I you? did. Look. Hmm? Look, the fellow's heading over here. That's got to be the peelers. Where are their uniforms? Oh, it must be the detectives. They get over from the castle fast. Gentlemen, my name is Chief Inspector Augustus Burton. This is Detective Officer Bradley. We got word there has been a body found, is that correct? Chief Inspector, thank you for coming so quickly and in person. I am Felix Stevens, the superintendent of the zoo. Good evening. There's been a terrible murder. Truly awful. Miss O'Dwyer here found the body with Sean Doyle as they were leaving, and we believe the suspect got away over there. The body, you see, is just beyond the bushes there, and when Sean and Sir, our... Sir, you'll need to start at the beginning. Where is the body? Right. Yes, sorry. Of course. It's just over here, if you want to follow. Wait, please. Now, Mr... Stevens. Mr. Stevens. Perhaps if Mr. Stevens here could bring me over to the body... My colleague, Detective Bradley, here will talk to the rest of the party. Yes, please. Let's move in out of the cold air. Just up here. Now, I know in your line of work you've probably seen a few things, but this is... Well, you'll see. Ah, yes. Let's have a look and uh, we'll... Mother of God, he's torn to shreds. And uh, is this how you found him? Yes, Miss O'Dwyer spotted his legs sticking out of the bushes as she and Sean were leaving and called me immediately. I see. 
And you called the police immediately? Well, we had a thought that, you know, because of how he looks and where we are, that with the zoo and everything... That he was attacked by a wild animal? Well, yes. I'm not sure if you remember that poor boy mauled to death here back in 91. A terrible accident, awful stuff. In any case, we immediately checked all the cages. You'll be glad to know that there are no missing wild animals. Everything is locked up safely in the zoo. Well, I think you'd be forgiven for thinking that this was some class of wild animal attack. Look at the man. You're absolutely positive. Yes, sir. We checked and rechecked all the cages. Nothing is open. Nothing tampered with or broken. All the most dangerous animals are in their cages. And, I mean, there's only a handful that could even do something like this. I see. Besides, we know who did it. Sorry, what? Yes, that's what I was trying to tell you earlier. When we were checking all the cages, we saw a man sprint across the grass. Over the way there, and scale the fence. Straight up it, fast as you like, not a bother. And what happened next? Well, he got away. He was much too fast and he had a head start. Sean was closer. Mr Dwyer and I were over this side near the entrance, so we couldn't see as much. You could talk to Sean about that anyway. I see. Any idea who he is? Who? The dead man. He's very well dressed, with that jacket and hat and everything. He must be someone important. No, I'm I'm afraid I don't know who the gentleman is. Well, I've seen enough for now. And this man you saw running off... You'd be best off asking Sean. He got a better look at him. Although it's a dark enough night. And from what you could see, Miss O'Dwyer, you'd, you'd agree with Mr Doyle? This man climbed the fence and was gone? Yes, sir. Straight up and over the fence and was long gone by the time Sean could get anywhere close. Detective, you've got a statement from everyone? Yes, sir. Right. For now, you're all free to go. I'll ask you all to report to Detective Bradley here at Lower Castle Yard at nine o'clock tomorrow morning. We'll have questions for you then. Mr Stevens, I'll need to talk to you first thing tomorrow morning. And I'll need to send a telegram from your office now. We'll need more men here. Yes, of course. The office is just here. I'll lock up here and be right with you. What do you think, sir? Jesus, Bradley. It's gruesome. The man's torn to shreds. Blood everywhere. Half his neck is gone. This Stevens fellow says it's not one of their animals, but we'll need to follow up on that. It looks like a lion attack or something. If it's not, I, I don't know. Could be the Fenians. You were there in 82, weren't you? A lowly detective officer like myself. Jesus, how could I forget? Another bloody Phoenix Park murder. But I don't know about this. It doesn't feel the same at all. I've heard nothing from any of the usual informants, and and there's not many who would do something like this right now. Well, there's this man they all saw dash out of the place. I don't know. He's a bit convenient, isn't he? What if it was one of the lions or something? They got it back in the cage and then they all saw this murderer sprinting out of the place. Hmm, maybe. I mean, they say he scaled that fence over there. That's what, 15 feet high? At least. Serious bit of climbing, all right. But, well, we can talk to them tomorrow, but they all seemed very genuine to me. There were no inconsistencies in their stories. I I don't know, sir. I believe them. Well, one thing's for sure. If it was a man, it wasn't robbery. The dead man's wearing a silver fob watch. Must be worth a fortune. It speaks to Stephen's employees' characters too that it's still there. And anything in his pockets? A card or something to identify him? I didn't need anything. And obviously do not mention this to Stephen's or any of the others, but I know who it is. What? Who? It's Sebastian Redgrave. Redgrave? As in... Yes, as in the only son of Lord Redgrave. We have just found the Chief Secretary for Ireland's son brutally murdered a few hundred yards from his house. Right, so this is going to be a long night then, I take it? It most certainly is, Detective. Thanks, David. I appreciate it. Now, here we are, Professor. Miss Carey's house is just across the way here. I do appreciate this, Miss Scott. And apologies if I was a little surprised earlier in the hotel. Please, don't mention it. Now everyone will be waiting for us. Of course. After you. Beatrice, I didn't know where you'd got to. 
And Professor Lombroso, what a pleasure to finally meet you. I'm Kate Carey. Please, come inside. Miss Carey, you are very kind. I believe we are ready to begin. My guests are all very anxious to converse with the dead. The Greatest Matter was written and directed by Connor Reid, recorded at the Podcast Studios Dublin and produced by Hilary Barry, with editing, sound design and original music by Connor Reid. Francis was played by Amy O'Dwyer. Margaret was Margaret McAuliffe. Professor Lombroso was Dunica O'Dee. Chief Inspector Burton was Dara Smith. And Dr Ryan was James Ward. Sean was played by Dara Smith. Anya and Beatrice were played by Amy O'Dwyer. Mr. Stevens was Dunnock O'D, Kate Carey was Margaret McAuliffe, and Detective Bradley was Connor Reed. Script support from Peter Dunn, artwork and design by Matt Mahon, marketing and promotional support from Claudia Grandes and Hilary Barry. This show is part of the Headstuff Podcast Network. For more on the network, all the great shows, and details on how you can support this show, go to headstuffpodcasts.com. For a deep dive into all things The Greatest Matter, you can head to thegreatestmatter.com, where you'll find actor bios, links, and further reading, images, full scripts, and lots more. Thanks for listening. show is part of the Headstuff Podcast Network, a hub for the creative and the curious. Shows are produced in association with Headstuff and the Podcast Studios Dublin. Find out more or become a member at headstuffpodcasts.com.